Today is Monday, June the 8th, 2009. My name is Karen <coughs> Newroar. I'm a librarian at the Oklahoma State University Library. And I'm here today at uh, Sonoma State University Library to interview Dr. Gerald Haslam. And this is for a project titled Remembering Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel, Poet and Oklahoma Dust Bowl Immigrant, an Oral History Project of the OSC Library. Thank you, Dr. Haslam, for um, coming today and um, letting me interview you for this project. I really appreciate it. How did you first learn about Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel? In the mid-1970s, uh, Eddie Lopez, who was the book editor of the Fresno Bee, sent me a book called The Red Coffee Can. Um, he, had, he had read it, he would liked it, he thought it was different, he knew but my taste was in matters dealing with the Central Valley of California. I was at the point then of beginning to do an anthology of literature, literary writing from the Central Valley. And, um, and he thought I would be interested in this particular, this particular author. Uh, he was right. Uh, I was amazed. I thought that it was some of the most wonderful stuff that I had read. It was totally unexpected. Uh, so I viewed Roma from the start as a sort of representative of the place where I had been born and raised down here on the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley where the uh, style, the culture was very much southwestern. I used to tell folks that uh, when I visited my dad's family in Texas I felt like I walked across the street. When I visited my mother's family in San Francisco I thought I was in Europe. Oh. Uh, it was just very, it was not like much of the rest of California, and Wilma expressed that extremely well, as far as I can see. But that was the introduction, was reading that book. I then tried to get in touch with her, and uh, ultimately did, uh, because I was uh, putting together a book called California Heartland, writing from the Great Central Valley, and uh, talked to her it's indirectly, really, uh, like I think at that point it was still just correspondence, but in any case, uh, selected some, some pieces from the book and, uh, and asked her if I could use them, and then she sent me some self-published material. And uh, the poetry in particular just amazed me. Uh, it, was, it seemed to me to be so honest, and yet there was that magical ability to, to make more of something than it seemed to be in itself. Uh, there was a suggestion of something more, and I don't know how else to put it. Uh, I guess I could read an example or something, but, uh, but uh, something like clothes dryer. This, the, the sort of magical way in which Ardella Pitts hung her husband out to dry uh, while hanging his clothes, the widow was hanging her husband's clothes. But, uh, I mean, that. The way she phrased that took it to an entirely different level. So I could just see that this was a person of exceptional ability. Mm -hmm. So that was um, when you first heard about her. So when, when did you first meet her then? When uh, California Heartland was published, uh, the, the initial reading of contributors was held at Upstart Crow Books in Fresno in 1978. Upstart Crow was a, a bookstore that, had, that served wine and beer and, uh, and had lots and lots of readings from folks from the Fresno State uh, Poetry Group, which at that point was beginning to be recognized as nationally and even internationally renowned. So in any case, they, we, the, first, uh, the first presentation of the book was at Upstart Crow. And I, uh, I wrote to him and invited her, and my, my co-editor, Jim Houston, wrote and invited her. She was pretty reluctant. She, she was not doing any public uh, engagements at that point. She wasn't used to being invited. In fact, I think this was the first material of hers that was ever anthologized. I'm pretty sure it was from what she told us. Well, she finally talked someone in, I don't recall who, whether it was Roy or Opal or some, but someone into bringing her to Fresno, bringing her up to Fresno and to Larry. Uh, for that evening reading, and that's where we met. And it was and it was interesting because there was a certain uh, re reserve about her. She was a little bit reluctant to open up, and uh, 
she so she joined us, and there were some fairly well known writers there, and um, and she seemed somewhat intimidated by the whole setting. And so just before it would have been her turn to read, she came to me and said, uh, I can't get up there and read in front of those people. And I said, well, um, what are you going to do? Do anything you want to do? She said, you read and I'll sit up there. Mm -hmm. So we, we walked up onto this platform, it really was not a stage. And they had to be, but there was, there was a good sized audience. This was the first book of its kind that had ever been done about that region. Mm -hmm. uh, and she sat in a in a chair, straight back chair, next to me, and I stood at the microphone and read her three selections from California Heartland. And uh, and then she acknowledged with kind of a nod of her head <laughs> the considerable applause. Uh, mm -hmm. and we talked a good deal afterwards, Jim, uh, my co-editor Jim Houston and Wilma and I, because we, we we really liked her. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that point on, there was a steady stream of correspondence, and uh, if I was doing a reading for one of my books anywhere in the area where she could get, get there, she would always show up, and I tried to attend as many of hers as I could. Um, very likable person, extremely likable. Um, could you talk a little bit about her oaky roots and uh, in relation to her writing? Well, when I read her work originally, I didn't even think of Oklahoma. I thought about the California version of Oki, the, the South Central Valley, that folks from all over the Southwest who came there and for a while were largely poor, were largely doing day labor, anything to survive. And out of that grew a culture or a subculture that she seemed to represent for me. You know, you read uh, in her poems, you read about people who were at Kmart, you read, you read about a black lady and a huge moo moo trying to make her way to a bargain table, things of that kind. Well, that, that's where I came from. That's the, the, the uh, world that I grew up in and knew well, and that's why I could see how genuine it was. I don't think I even thought much about the Oklahoma part of it until she brought it to my attention. Mm. Um, like most people who are kids who are raised in a world, that becomes the virtual world. That becomes the whole world you know. And uh, the one that I was raised in, the, the Southern Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley, was a world in itself to me. And so everything I judged was on that basis. And she was absolutely true to the place. She was absolutely true to the class of people. She was smart enough to understand that the so-called dust mole or oaky migrants to California were not all white. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. They think everybody was white. Um, and there was a truth in what she was doing about the region that I think that, that made it possible to, for other writers to open up. And one of the things that she did that, that uh, was new to me was uh, she avoided the trap of becoming militantly angry about the way Southwesterners have been treated or the trap of becoming placating, you say, oh, you know, oh, well, of course we're inferior, but give us a chance. None of that, either of those extremes. She just presented people as people with dignity. Uh, they might not have money, but they always had dignity in her stories. And if she presented a rat, you knew it was a rat on purpose. You knew she was talking about some village, some poltroon. Uh, only later, when she began to show me work that, that dealt with her youth, did I uh, get any glimpses of the world that she had come from? And what I got from that primarily was the strength of family. Was that no matter what uh, the economic circumstances were, there was there was a strength uh, of unity in her family. Wherever they were, they were going to be strong. They were going to support one another. And of course, I later saw that when I got to know uh, her brother and sister, and saw them together more than once. So d does anything um, come to your mind any particular time when you saw the three of them together about that you think of when you think of that? Well, what was Opal like? Opal was funny. Opal was more expressive than, uh, than Wilma. Well, let me tell you a story about Wilma and Opal. I was uh, doing a, uh, a lecture at Modesto Junior College, what it was, the faculty convocation, and I just 
uh, published a book about the Central Valley, and so they invited me over to, to give a kind of overview to the, the assembled faculty. Well, Wilma was living in Modesto at that time, and so she and Opal were invited over, I think by Lillian, uh, Lillian Valley, and they showed up, and so, uh, and I was there early, and so we, we communicated for a while, talked for a while, joked for a while, and then I excused myself and said, I've got to run the restroom, so I'm going to give a talk here in a moment. And, uh, so they said bye-bye, and I walked in the restroom. Well, my wife had said to me when I left home that morning, you're not wearing those trousers, are you? <laughs> and I was dressed in my cowboy vest, had my boots on, had some nice western cut slacks, nice western shirt. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, my, my wife said, you're, you're getting too big for those. And I said, no, no, they feel just fine. So I w walked in the restroom, <laughs> stood before the urinal, and I heard pop. Oh. And the, oh, the zipper popped out of the trousers, and all of a sudden I, saw I had this big gap in the front of my trousers. <laughs> this was just before I was supposed to go on. I thought, oh boy. So I walked back holding my head, I had my speech <laughs> and then the folder holding it in front of me to Wilma and Opal. I said, you guys got a safety pin? <laughs> and they said, what for? And I went, <laughs> flashed them, and they, they started laughing and carrying on. And Opal got out of safety pin that must have been that long. <laughs> so I went back in the bedroom, and, I, and I, there was no way I could hide it. I, you know, it was just so big, and, and the, the disaster was so great. So I just put it on the outside and, uh, and walked up, and I thanked them. And they, were, they were just carrying on. Nobody could figure out why they were laughing. So I then walked up, I was introduced, and they, as, usual, as usual, excessively fulsome. Uh, introduction. You'd think it would be, it was either Gandhi or Mother Teresa or somebody who was actually speaking. And so I got there and I and I thanked the uh, person who introduced me and I said, I want you folks, faculty members, all to know what a brilliant person they have actually brought in here today. And then I moved my manila folder and the whole place broke, just absolutely broke up. And uh, and Opal never forgot that. And every time I saw her after that, she said she had a safety pin for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was had I yet learned to listen to my wife. <laughs> and, uh, and Wilma loved that too. We, 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 but Opa was, Opa was just a little more uh, expressive as a speaker, and, and she a little more apt to put her arm in your back and pat you a little bit. Uh, Wilma wasn't wasn't reserved in a negative sense, but there was just a, she wasn't quite as expressive. Uh, both of them were, were quite warm, though, as is Roy. They were, they were all uh, nice people, good people to be around. And, Always enjoyable. Always, always something to laugh about. Did you meet their mother? I never did. I knew about her mm -hmm. because I was corresponding with Wilma while Mama was still alive, but I never did meet her. No. Mm -hmm. They called her Mama. No, that's what they called her in my presence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you um, do you know anything about different jobs that that she held? Over no, the years, I really don't. I mean, I never really talked to her about that. I knew she held various jobs, but it just never it never came up to any extent. Uh, we did talk. I, I know she did some of the same kind of field work I did because we talked a little about that at one point. But but she she had a a varied career. I know, as they as they say, and I'm I'm just not up on that at all. What about different places that she lived? I knew about a number of those because I uh, I would see her in places like Bakersfield when she lived there and Modesto when she lived Can there. Can you sort of like kind of run through the different places well, you're places aware of? The places that I'm aware of were, were Bakersfield on the southern end of the Central Valley and then up 99 about 70 miles is Tulare which is where she was primarily located. Visalia is just over about 13 or 14 miles to east of that. I think she was very briefly in Visalia or one of the little towns around Visalia. And then Modesto, uh, which is another 120 miles north of Tulare, um, also in the Central Valley. The, the Central Valley has a, a road that runs right through the middle of it, basically, Highway 99. And these little towns I'm talking about are, are like beads on that chain. They just uh, move up and down that. So she was uh, what a lot of folks like to call the Oki Main Line in California, you know, because when folks came in from the southwest, they would come up over the Tehachapi Pass, usually also, you can also do this through Los Angeles, to Highway 99, and then Highway 99 took you right into the agricultural heart of California, where there was seasonal work. 
And you might not be right on Highway 99, but that was the way you got into the region for any of these little towns off to the side where someone might pick or drive a tractor or something of that kind. So she's, during my period of uh, friendship with her, she always lived in that, along that line. And, I, and this is why the, she knew so many people who, uh, who did seasonal work and suffered seasonal poverty, but kept their dignity. Was she still working when you knew her? I think she was, but I don't know what exactly, because when we originally began corresponding for a long time, about all we talked about was writing. Mm -hmm. We were both writers, and, uh, and I was very interested in her work. Um, I could see, I, could, I felt in my heart when I read it that it was true. There was very, very similitude there. It wasn't something she was contriving. You know, yeah, I don't think you can try the kind of characters that she wrote about. She was observing, and uh, but uh, I just don't recall that we ever sat and, and discussed that sort of thing. A lot of talk about writing, though. I find it interesting that that she was moving around like that during you know the '70s yeah. and perhaps the '80s too. I don't know if that way. I, that may have had more to do with the job that some one of the other family members had. Okay. They were very close family, very tightly mm -hmm. knit. Uh, but I just don't remember ever talking about work. Um, and I always thought of her, and, I, and, and, and due to this day, as primarily just being someone from Tulare who just happened to, happened to stumble out of town periodically for one reason or another. After your um, initial meeting and the developing friendship, did, did she ever ask for your advice on writing or publishing? Uh, not really. Uh, she was pretty much self-contained, I thought. Uh, I think she knew that I was really just a fellow writer rather than a publisher. And, but I think she also knew that I, any, any of the situations that I was in where I, I could get her work published, I would. And, I did uh, three anthologies, for example, and her work is in all of, is in all of them. What are the titles of those? Well, this was uh, California Heartland, writing mm -hmm. from Central Valley, and then the first edition of Many Californias, writing from the Golden State. And then I used another set of poems you know, for the second edition that was published ten years later. Um, what, my, what I was trying to do was give her the widest possible exposure. In fact, the other things I would do is when, for example, poets and writers would contact me and would uh, contemporary authors or any of these books that, that uh, do capsule biographies of writers and then ask them a few questions about their taste. I would always list her as one of my favorite writers, which is true, but I knew that most people were not going to have heard of her. They're going to know who the New York Times recommends. Mm -hmm. And it's just what you don't want to do is pay any attention to the New York version of what's California's best writer. But, uh, but people do it. So I always, I always made sure that I, that I mentioned her and I used her work in my classes. In recent years, uh, I've been teaching in lifelong learning since I retired, and one or two courses a year here at the University of San Francisco. And I have, I have shown uh, down the old road over and over again, and people are, are just amazed. Mm -hmm. uh, they, didn't, they didn't know she was around because they're mostly your city folks that are teaching. How, um, how did students respond to her? when you started teaching about her in classes? Well, I, <laughs> they liked her, first of all, with no, with no exception. I can't remember anybody getting, mm -hmm. getting offended or, or, or being negative. The thing is that you know, so much of poetry is, is self-conscious and pretentious, and, uh, and then you get somebody who is not self-conscious and is not pretentious, who is down to earth, who's using language that you can understand, and yet is doing things with it that it, that is just not common to see done. Um, I mean, that's, I used to always say, and I still tell my students this, that uh, every poet of quality reinvents poetry. You know, it's too late to be E.E. E. Cummings because somebody already did that, already played that role. Mm -hmm. And Wilma was not like anybody else. She was, and, and I use that even with my writing students. I was, when I taught writing, it would be prose writing, I would teach. But I would always say, you know, 
seek your original voice. And you do that by looking past expectation. And here's somebody who just sat down and observed the world around her and used the language she heard the world around her and did something quite magical as a result of that because she understood that just things are not only what they are. It's what, it's what you, the creative person, can do with them that makes them something special. And she really understood that. She was an innately creative person. And uh, so students, uh, as I recall, always really liked her work. And, and I would frequently hear, in fact, more so now in the lifelong learning where folks are over 50, why haven't we heard of her before? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> I put her in every anthology I've edited. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of, uh, kind of regret that they didn't know her. Because mm -hmm. there's something personal about her, her work. This is a personality you would like to, to touch. Which, which of her works in particular were you, would you go back to over and over again when you were teaching as far as introducing people to her? And maybe then and even now, maybe it's the same. Well, if I use a book, it would be Sister Vida's song. But I, 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 uh, one of the things that I tried to do was uh, show how she had grown and changed as a writer, because people do. You can't just do the same thing over and over again. And so I would, I would uh, take the, re the examples from California Heartland, and then the examples from the first edition, and then the second edition of Many Californias, and they would see mm -hmm. some distinct changes going on there. And I would tell them that one of the dangers for poets, and for any writer for that matter, and I was always worried about it with Wilma, is, is when people start taking you seriously, you start taking yourself too seriously. And, it, and then you might find yourself becoming a self-conscious writer, at which point the spontaneity and the beauty can be lost. I think she did that, by the way, toward the end a oh, little bit. Oh, I don't, not, I don't mean everything she did. Right. But there are examples that strike me as being poetry about poetry. Uh -huh. And when that happens, uh, it, it's not, it doesn't reach the same level. And I think it's a danger for any writer, by the way, not just for poets. Poets, I think, you see it more profoundly in poets because of the tightness uh, of their work. But if I'm writing it, like the, the manuscript that I'm proofreading now is 130,000 words. I've got a lot of room there to cheat without anybody noticing, <laughs> as if they read it at all, of course. Uh, with, with Wilma, you know, and she's got, got 12 lines of five or six words each, you're going to notice something. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, uh, by and large, was not a problem with her. It, 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 right at the very end, maybe, again, because there were starting to be things written about her. Mm -hmm. And I, I just to say something about myself for a second, I don't read book reviews in my books. Mm -hmm. I don't care about them. Mm -hmm. I write the books and do the best I can and move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to try to please a reviewer. And I think that would be, you know, if somebody in the Publishers Weekly or LA Times says if so and so had only done this, he'd be a, he'd be a good writer. Well, I, I'm not worried about what they think would make a good writer, and I I don't think Wilma was either. I think, in fact, I think she was a little astonished when people began writing articles about her. I think I published the first article about her in Western American Literature, maybe about 1980 at the latest. Articles, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, but uh, she, I mean, she. she she did read the stuff about her. <laughs> she sent copies of yeah. uh, reviews to yeah. people in Oklahoma <laughs> that she corresponded with. Yeah, you know, she, I can understand that, though. She, she was, in a sense, so isolated for so long. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was fully middle-aged when she walked into the Tulare record and, and showed Tom that box of anecdotes and poems and things. So that, that when, when all of a sudden uh, the the interactive world took notice of her. I think it's only human nature that you would say, oh my gosh, look at this, they like it. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't even get these away. <laughs> Do you think, um, yeah, talk about the fact that she, she really didn't start publishing until she was middle-aged, and I'm not exactly sure maybe how her mother's death might have fit into that with her and Probably that's not something we would want to go into anyway, but um, is that unusual? What do you think? Well, you know, uh, when, she, when she became known in the Central Valley, where her, her first fame arose, uh, people were calling her the Grandma Moses oh. of poetry. But I thought she was more like Emily Dickinson. 
if you were mm -hmm. going to name mm -hmm. a writer in the American literary past. Mm -hmm. Because just like Emily Dickinson, she was an acute observer of the world around her. And, and she, she clearly, I mean, like all of us, she had her areas of illusion and so on. But nevertheless, she seemed to have, have a, a real understanding of the dynamic of people interacting with people or interacting with place, as a matter of fact, of the, of the power of memory, uh, of how time itself can be transcended by memory. Uh, and uh, uh, when, she, when she wrote, she drew from a great storehouse of observation, I keep using this word observation, a great storehouse of memory. Um, and I think a lot of the things that she wrote were, uh, the, the little vignettes that she wrote were probably like the kind of notes I make, prose notes I make, uh, except that she, she would put them in little, in little chunks of verse. And one of the things that I, I, I saw, because she was in all the, I can't tell you how many letters she sent me, sometimes two or three a week for a while. Uh, but they would just be on a piece of paper this big. Mm -hmm. And there would often be just a hello and then a little verse or a little observation in longhand. Um, and I noticed that, that sometimes she would, she would mention seeing a man wearing two different cow, kinds of cowboy boots at the stock auction, uh, you know, a brown one and a black one or something. And, but the last line would, would, would be something often, would be something that made it a little poetic, made it, you could see the possibility of a poem coming out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think she was uh, watching the world around her intently, and be, because so much of her life was constrained, an awful lot of energy was going into saying what's possible. Mm -hmm. Where might these people go? What might they do? I mean, she was actually a fair, in talking with her, at least, she was a fairly innocent person. In some, maybe, or maybe I know a lot of people who are not very innocent. Maybe, and so thus, she seems innocent. But there was there was a kind of innocence, and it showed, I think, in her power of observation, and in, in, in the fact that she would be she wasn't taking things for granted. Uh, Henry James, not my favorite writer, but Henry James once said, "Become one of those upon whom nothing is lost." which is, I think, one of the great bits of advice for any writer. And uh, I think Wilma was one of those upon whom nothing was lost, or very little, at least, was lost. Uh, I can remember uh, when I was a kid driving by a, a tractor uh, outlet in, outside of Bakersfield and noticing that they had red tractors and green tractors and yellow tractors and thinking somehow about the rainbow, just when I was a kid. Mm. And so I said something to uh, my uncle who was driving, who was a farmer, and he said, yeah. <laughs> there was no wonder and awe in uh -huh. his observation. Wilma retained the wonder and awe, uh -huh. and that gave her material that was there for everybody. Uh -huh. But she could see that significance. A poem like Clothes Dryer, uh -huh. You're just thinking about what she actually says in that poem is uh -huh. very interesting. Uh -huh. So I, um, there, there was her interaction, her, her participation in the world around her uh, gave her a storehouse of material that others just didn't recognize, I think. They, I think they, some do now. Mm -hmm. There are young writers who are reading their woman with Daniel and beginning to look around their own world a little more closely. Mm -hmm. When you first met her, did she seem confident about her writing? She seemed satisfied, I think I would say. Mm -hmm. she, she knew she had done what she could. She was not embarrassed by it. I think that, that, that her great crisis came when she dropped that box of papers off Tom Heenan. Um, the, that was the hard thing, was taking that box in there. And if you think about it, I mean, 99 times out of 100, if you did that, somebody would hand you your box back. Because I've lived in the literary world now myself for almost five decades, and that's how I understand how it works very often. She found the right person at the right time, but and it was just it was pure happenstance, as near as I can tell. But the fact that she had self-publishing, began to self-publish, tells you she had some confidence. She wanted people to see him. She wasn't just writing for herself. And... Uh, and so I think that I think that 
maybe confidence is too strong a word, but there was certainly hope. And very often with a writer, that's what you need is hope and, and a certain grit because you're going to have negative uh, responses no matter who you are, no matter how well you write. And you can't let it crush you. You just have to say, well, to hell with them and just keep keep on. Are you aware of, um, of whether she took any um, college classes at all? I, it's my understanding that she left Oklahoma when she was 17 and she wasn't able to finish high school in Oklahoma, but then when she came to California, she did complete her high school yeah. degree. And I've heard bits and pieces that perhaps maybe she did take some classes later. She never talked to me about classes, and I, I would have thought she would because she knew that I was I was supporting my writing habit by teaching at the university. Mm -hmm. There was a very good community college where she lived, College of the Sequoia, which is really one of the better junior colleges in California. So I'm sure that there are plenty of courses available to her, but she no, she didn't ever mention that. Um, Did she, what was her view of academics? Well, I think I think that she was quite was positive about it, mm -hmm. and may, of course, again, because I was making my living at it, maybe she wouldn't say anything to me that was <laughs> negative. Uh, I had some negative views about it, <laughs> as anyone does who works in a field, but. Uh, I think she was very grateful for the attention that she got from academics, and, and we did talk about you know, just the fact that, that that when one or two of these professors in professional journals write something about you, it really does open doors, and she understood that very well indeed, and uh, was extremely cooperative. You know, I I sent her a. Uh, uh, Series of questions to be to, to like an interview, except she could write her answers. Mm -hmm. Your people can correct their mistakes more easily that way, not, not double speak or something. And uh, and told her I was going to publish it in, a, in an academic journal, and she was quite happy about that. Um, but I think when you haven't had any attention at all for a long time, any literary attention, I mean, of course. Um, the very first thing you see is going to be a little daunting because you're going to wonder what they say about you. The, the, this is, she was not a control freak. She was not somebody who, who wanted to control how people thought about her. But she, so she never nevertheless had some trepidation. But in general, I think she was quite pleased. Do you think, uh, what about views of your contemporaries in her writing? Um, did you see any? Or can you talk about that at all? You mean what, what they thought about it? Mm -hmm. Most of the people who were close to me, and I'm thinking of people like Jim Houston, uh, really liked her work. And if they had any Southwestern connection at all, they really liked her work. Um, I was at, at the, the Crystal Palace, Buck Owens nightclub in Bakersfield, one night. <laughs> Uh, and it was just it was serendipitous. I had actually taken the train down because I was going to give a talk at the community college there the next day. And so my old buddies came and picked me up, and we all went over there to eat dinner and drink some beer and, and watch Buck perform because he performed on the weekends. Well, while we were sitting there, um, Buck, between songs, had, and he had a, a very unique way of presenting himself. And he, he said, You know, you know, he almost always started with, You know, you know. There's a lady sitting up there in the audience that wrote a poem about me, and I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> and I thought, there's only one lady in the world that I know who's ever written a poem, but <laughs> Anne Wilma was in the audience, and I didn't know it at the time. Uh, and so he read Kmart Sage. You remember that one? Yes. Uh, put that head on a woman, and they'd run her out of town. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and of course the audience just roared, and he just roared, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that, that that was representative of the way in which uh, folks with some southwestern roots, like me, like Buck, felt about her. There were, she was one of us. She was an insider. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, others, I think, were, were more trouble. I, I talked to some folks who were part of the Fresno Poet Group, because when I did the, uh, the California Anthology, I had a number of these award-winning poets from Fresno State, Philip Levine, this trained wonderful poet, wonderful teacher. Uh, but some of them were a little suspect, because this was not the kind of poetry that, that they saw as being modern or postmodern. 
or submodern or any kind of modern, uh, they have they have become a little too quote unquote sophisticated uh, to to appreciate it. I mean, there there if if it depends on how you look at it. If you can look at Wilma's work and you can see it as kind of the lyrics to bad country songs without the music. I mean, there are people who see it that way. That's kind of the way they were looking at it. I don't see that. You know, I can look at it, these poems, even the, the simplest of these in uh, in California Heartland, the letter to Cleotas, clothes dryer, leftovers, have to me got the kind of twist. May I read one? But that, yes, yeah, please. Let me just, mm -hmm. I'll just read, uh, I'll read leftovers that I've already talked about, clothes dryer. Table scraps are useful, and prophets, there is one in my family who noticed a half jar of gin left on the table after a tornado fell to Clifford on a day so quiet we could hear him breathing happily about a girl who lived down in Bowlegs. The prophet said, a half jar of jelly is only a life half spent. There will be other loaves of bread, other knives as sharp as Clifford's that will slice the days as thick and spread the nights as lavishly until we reach the sugar crystals in the bottom of the jar. I mean, she's, she's taken a mundane thing and it's become magical. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's opened in ways that I think only really wonderful writers can do. And uh, I, I've seen an awful lot of people with creative writing degrees who can't do that. They can tell you everything there is about a sonnet, uh, and they can talk about alliteration and consonants, but they can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's the magic uh, that we call talent. And she did it again and again and again, uh, almost always drawing on the simple, humble uh, observations, the simple, um, humble uh, uh, sketches, and then boom, they open up. They don't always boom and open up, of course. <laughs> she mm -hmm. writes some lousy stuff, too. Mm -hmm. But that's the, you have to be willing to do that. I used to always tell my writing students, you, if you're unwilling to fail, if you're unwilling to make a mistake, find another profession because you're never going to be any good. Mm -hmm. You have to try new things, and sometimes when you try new things, you fail. Sometimes you have to try them 20 times before you do them as well as you'd like to, or 200 times. Mm -hmm. And I think she understood all of that. Um, I think early in her career, she published things that were that were as wonderful as this and things that were absolutely lousy because she couldn't tell the difference. Uh, and that's one of the hard skills to learn for anybody. You know, Many of us have been publishing books for years and years and years, well, all of a sudden come out with a clunker because we, we've fallen so in love with the, whatever it is we're writing, the story, that we no longer see it objectively and understand that it's, it's really not as good as we think it is. And so she had that problem too, but the problem, it's worth the price. Right. You know, if, you, if, there's, if there's one pearl among the, the peas, I'll take the pearl. I have to work uh, through that. Well, I'm perfectly willing to sit with the peas to get the pearl. <laughs> she had more, more pearls than peas, I think. Mm. <laughs> Did, um, what what influences do you see in her writing? And I know that can be pretty broad when you think about that. Well, you know, I'm, I, I'm probably a terrible literary scholar because I never really thought of her in those terms. I know that's exactly what you're supposed to do when you teach literature. Uh, but I would, you know, I would say, uh, as I said, Emily Dickinson mm -hmm. may or may not have been an influence, but there's certainly a, a powerful similarity there. Uh, I like the, the barren language you see in much of her work that is like William Carlos Williams, but I don't think that she necessarily read William Carlos Williams. And, and you can go down this long list of things like that. There's a certain quality that's like the Spoon River Anthology in, in this. Uh, but I would think that my own guess, if I, if I you know, well, I think as I've said this in print too, uh, I think she was as much influenced by the oral tale tellers of her, of her family and of her culture, by the by the uh, the, the, the bards such as uh, Woody Guthrie, and commercial country singers, and by the Bible, which I think had a very big influence on her, and uh, uh, she was she was uh, religious without being heavy-handed about it. Mm -hmm. She she carried it lightly. It was her it was her secrece. It was her it was her uh, relief from life, and. Uh, and you could just see it in her. There was a certain, there was a certain placidness about her when things seemed to be going haywire that I, that I really admired. Um, 
So I, I find it hard to, to think of any direct literary influences. You know, I can look at Gary Soto and I can see Philip Levine, for example, two of my favorite poets. Uh, but I can't do that with one. Mm -hmm. I, I can, as I say, allude to, to someone like, like uh, uh, Emily Dickinson, or, but I'm, I'm not sure I believe there's any direct lineage. I think that they were perhaps drawing in the way, for example, Walt Whitman draws from the vernacular language in the 19th century. That's what Wells was doing in the 20th. Do, did she read Walt Whitman? I have no idea. Um, I, I don't think she had to because all she had to do was listen, and I think that's what she was best at, was mm -hmm. uh, capturing these voices. That, and often it's the rhythm. She doesn't use a lot of, of eye dialogue, as we call it. He doesn't use a lot of words that, with missing letters and things of that kind. She does occasionally, but that's, that's not common. Uh, rather, it, it is capturing the rhythm and the vocabulary. Uh, uh, what's the one about old Charlotte that's in, in the hospital and he says, they, they've taken my trousers and left me a prisoner. <laughs> well, you know, the, anybody who, who's, you know, I can remember the first summer I worked in the oil fields when I was a kid, and old man who was a driller came to me and he's, well, hell, they've taken away the cigars, I never even got one. And my dad didn't didn't have a heavy doll like that, and, and I thought that was wonderful, beautiful. And it's an old English form. It's an older and more traditional form, actually, than so-called standard English. Uh, it, the, 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 the standard English has changed more rapidly. Um, well, Wilma heard those things, and, and she knew that that would, you hear, you, you hear that word, you see that word used, and you know the kind of character you're dealing with. You know something about her. There may be, a, there may just be assumptions, but that we do care have assumptions. We have connotations with these things, and she understood that. So, um, while I don't think she studied linguistics, I think she was a linguist, uh, and I don't think she really studied poetry in the sense that, that people wouldn't have created a writing program today. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think she was a poet. I, I've, I've often said that that the best thing that can happen to you is not be admitted to a creative writing program. <laughs> not because there's anything wrong with it, but because people get ahead of their experience. You get 20-year-olds with wonderful skills and no life experience. Mm. Wilma had a lot of life experience, mm -hmm. and she borrowed other people's life experiences, as you should. I will, uh, I'm trying to think who said this. Uh, I think it was Maya Angelou who, who said, don't, don't ever say anything around a writer that you don't want to see in print. <laughs> and uh, actually told me a long story about that that I won't go into today, but it's a fun story. Uh, and I think Wilma was like that. I think she was listening all the time. You know, I used to always tell my students, you, whatever you, wherever you go, you always carry your Palm Pilot. Mm -hmm. and this is the, as close to a Palm Pilot as I've ever carried, but mm -hmm. in here are just things I'm, I observe, little notes. She did the same kind of thing. Did she do that too? She did not use a notebook, I don't think. She had short shafts of paper, mm -hmm. shards of paper. But uh, uh, because you don't know from mm -hmm. moment to moment what you're going to see that might not be exactly what will make your next novel, your next poem, your next play uh, memorable. Mm -hmm. It's going to—it's all out there. Where there's human beings is where the, the real material lies. We, we talked about this um, in our phone conversation earlier. Um, and it has to do with um, perspectives of her writing that um, ways that people look at someone's writing and what kinds of lens they can view um, a person's writing through. And there are, of course, many ways to, to look at that. Um, like, I mean, looking at things with a social lens or Maybe, um, and really, I guess it has to do with classification in a way, like folklore, um, you know, a social perspective, um, culture, class, um, feminist, historical. Um, could you talk about that, just anything? You're like, what's your viewpoint on that? Well, I think that one of the most interesting things about, uh, particularly the kind of poetry Wilma Rice, that is fairly bare and fairly brief, uh, is that, uh, Five people can read, and it can be five different poems. And I think that's kind of what you want, because I think the function of the writer is to stimulate the creativity of the reader. And this is, again, what I used to teach my, my writing students. And they, we write the, the, the book, we write the poem, we write the, the song lyric, 
but the but the auditor or the reader completes it. And there's one of the great fallacies I used to encounter, and I still encounter, by the way, in the lifelong learning program, because people have been told this, is that if you want to know what something really means, ask the writer. That's absolute nonsense. The writer doesn't know what the writer doesn't know what he or she has accomplished. They know what they intended to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You know, so if uh, I was just to pick an example, I was. Uh, giving a talk down at the Steinbeck Center in Salinas, uh, and uh, someone asked, what, what is uh, Jacqueline, uh, John Steinbeck's uh, finest novel? And I said, well, I think about it. For me, it would be The Grapes of Wrath or In Dubious Battle. And the uh, lady in the audience said, well, he said it was East of Eden. Oh. And I said, well, he didn't know what he was talking about. And dead silence. And then how can you say that? Uh -huh. And I said, I'll tell you what I can say. He knew what he wanted to be his greatest novel. He knew where his hopes lie. But he didn't know what he had accomplished. No writer knows. No artist knows. You just know what you what you put into it. And uh, and 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 so I think that that uh, when a writer writes in such a way as to allow readers to be co-creators, then there then there is a feeling in the heart of the reader that is much deeper than any sort of intellectual experience can possibly give you. And I think Wilma did that. And I've tried to do it. I don't know that I've done it as well as she has, but, that, but that's really the goal. Uh, so for me, that's where I start. I, I start with this, this, you know, whether some, someone's going to bring uh, a, a feminist approach or a regionalist approach or whatever approach. And, then, and there's certain, every one of those brings their own potential for assessment. Which one is right? Well. Uh, they all are or none of them are, is the answer. Mm -hmm. It depends on the particular assessor and the particular moment in time. Uh, and I think that's true of all art. I think that's true of Shakespeare as it is of Wilma McDaniel. I guess I just start with the premise, and I know, and I, and I, I know Wilma felt in a very similar way. We didn't talk about this explicitly. But you start with the premise that, that what a writer like Wilma has and what she does is simply take normal human characteristics to a more intense or elevated degree. And that means that other people can share that. Even, you know, there are people who are wonderful readers but are not good writers. Mm -hmm. Many of them are called professors. <laughs> they they, they uh, read literature, they can explain it, and they're wonderful readers. But they have, they're not successful when it comes to, to doing it themselves. And that's not, it's not to fault them, it's just a fact. Everybody is not going to be a, 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 an outstanding writer, uh, just as everybody's not going to be an outstanding reader or a fast runner or a this or a that or the other. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I like the fact that people will bring, even though I may disagree with what they say, I like the fact that people will bring their agendas and try to, to take a look at Wilma or anyone else, by the way, um, from those perspectives. What I don't like is when they're dishonest about it, that is when they, when they begin starting to force stuff because that's what they want the writer to have said, mm -hmm. and that's easy to do. I know in uh, student papers I've seen this a lot, and I'm sure I've been guilty of it too, because I, Lord knows I had to write a lot of papers to get the degrees I had that got me the job here at the university. And, uh, but I, uh, I think Wilma, is, like, as, as is true of most uh, writers of quality, Wilma is open to various kinds of interpretations. And as long as someone is honest and really deals with her text, um, then they can, they can do a good job. I think, however, they'll do a better job if they also understand the context of the text. That if she was writing in a particular time, in a particular place, and I don't think that, the, the, speaking personally now, I don't think that, that the interpretation should be limited to that. That is, people who won't know a cotton bowl uh, from a cotton shirt, uh, 50 years from now, who will have never done the kind of work that she did, can read her poems and be inspired by it, I think. And, I, and that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, the reason we, we have courses in people like Shakespeare, who was readily understood by the populace of his time, is that the context has changed. And in order to understand what he was about, we do that. We, 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 we try to explain as best we can. And people may or may not be doing that with Wilma's uh, poetry 100 years from now. I hope they are, but if they aren't, so be it. But as long as something uh, innovative and inspirational 
can come from it, I think that's okay. It may not be exactly what she intended, but her intent is not the end of it. It's only her intent. Uh, anyway, I've got me, got me going to a sermon that, there. That, no, stop. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um. We've gone through um, a lot of these things, which, which is good. Do you know anything about her, her particular writing habits? Well, if you mean, you know, did she get up and write first thing in the morning, something like that? I honestly don't. I, I know, as I said, that she, she made notes and she would, and she. I was led to believe that basically, when something grabbed her at any time of the day or night, she would write. Now that was that was what I was led to believe, mm -hmm. and it sure looked that way. Some of the things she sent me, you know, they'd be all catawampus. It looks like they're written in the dark <laughs> occasionally. Uh, I mean, it was great fun to, re to receive correspondence from her because you would have oftentimes you'd have a letter, uh, you know, two or three paragraph letter, and, and then on the other side would be a poem. Sometimes it would be an old poem. Sometimes it would be an attempt at a new poem. I once asked her, I said, listen, when you send me those poems, you've got copies of them, don't you? She said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And she did, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, I used to tell her that my, my uh, uh, mode of, of work was to get up first thing in the morning at about five and write until I had to come to the university. But she said, well, I don't have a university I have to go to. <laughs> Which tells me that she could write any time. Right. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, and I think she did. And I think she was not quite as casual as a lot of people like to think she was. I mean, I think she was pretty careful about what she said. I think she went over things pretty carefully and, and got used the words she wanted as she wanted them used. doesn't mean she didn't make mistakes, but it just means that it, 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 this wasn't something she just dashed off, as mm -hmm. some people seem to think. You know, they've often said that the, the most difficult kind of writing is that which... Uh, appears to be least uh, crafted because you know, you've taken out all of the stuff that, that would, the signs, the signals that would allow people to see the, the, the route of your craft. And I think she was in that, in that, you want to say school, I suppose is the right word. What do you think are her best works? She wrote, um, of course, she wrote the poems. She wrote um, columns for the uh, South Valley Arts paper. Um, vignettes, they've termed you know, her stories vignettes, and then even some longer stories. Um, which of those types of things that she wrote do you think sort of come to the top? I think poetry is by far the best, speaking myself, and because it's better edited. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that, that when, she, when she was writing prose, she was, I think she was much less conscious of her editing. I think, I think she felt, as a lot of people do, by the way, who are poets, that when you get to prose, it, it's, uh, it's more like no holes barred. Uh, all of them, it's wonderful images and observations, some, some wonderful scenes and, and uh, stretches of dialogue and things in, in all the prose. I actually like the vignettes. Uh, too, because they're very close. They're like prose versions of the poems. Many of the poems, I think, started. I would bet started as vignettes, and then she rearranged them. You know, one of the one of the uh, definitions, of ways, I should better say, one of the ways to define poetry relative to prose, that that increasingly, actually, since the birth of modernism, has increasingly been been a problem for folks. You know, that that doesn't look like poetry to me. Is simply. What happened? Where, did, where does the line end on the right side? If the poet decides where the line ends, then it's poetry. If the writer allows the printer to fold the lines in, then it's prose. And and that's I mean it's pretty pretty bare knuckle to come up with those two in, but that's I think it's just about what it was. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody actually telling you what the lines are and where they break. Uh, that's poetry, and that's why I think she's better at that. Because when she, when you do that, you have to make some self-conscious decisions about the, the material. You know, you, you you might have three or four lines of, of uh, eight or nine beats, and all of a sudden you just have a name for a line. Well, you know, then that name is important. Uh, uh, if, if it was in prose, I suppose you could underline it, and do 
the same kind of thing or italicizing. So I, I prefer the poetry. I think I think she was at her best in the poetry. But there's, I mean, she was a good writer. She could write anything, um, anything that I read anyway. I thought some of the stuff in the, in the, the South Valley, I forgot that, what's the, end of the name of the issue, the South Valley News or whatever it was that they, she would send me, it was pretty darn good too. But if I had to choose it, I would always pick poetry. This is our um, second part of our interview. Today's Monday, June the 8th, 2009. And my name is Karen Newroar, and I'm interviewing Dr. Gerald Haslam. And we'll move on into this. This is for the Remembering Wilma Elizabeth McDaniel Poet and Oklahoma Dust Bowl Immigrant Project. Um, one of the things that I would like to ask you about is, um, it has to do with labels that uh, people put on other people. Uh, when they write about them or they talk about them. Um, could you talk about that a little bit with Wilma? What what types of labels were put on her? Well, I think the most limiting label she probably ever had was that she was a San Joaquin Valley writer in California where everybody thinks culture exists only in L.A. and the Bay Area. Uh, and it, it, there really was in those years uh, a renaissance that was beginning to occur that made people aware that, that the region that she comes from is actually quite a, an active literary region. And she was, uh, she was writing about 40 miles up the road where, where Luis Valdez, the great uh, Chicano playwright, was raised. Uh, she was writing about 100 miles south of where Maxine Honkaston and Richard Rodriguez and uh, Joan Didion were from. Uh, up about uh, 72 miles north of where Frank B. Dart and Robert Duncan are from, and yet people in California didn't, uh, they didn't see that part of the state as being literary or having literary potential. They thought of, as I say, the, the quote-unquote cultural centers of Southern California and Northern California. Um, and so I think being taken seriously as a writer from those regions was difficult at first. Um, She came along at the right time for the label Oki to, to, to take on real importance. When, when I was a kid, uh, you didn't want to call somebody an Oki unless you wanted to fight uh, because it was used negatively. I mean, the, the, there was nothing inherently wrong with, with the label itself, of course, but people were using it as a negative term. And, uh, and I, I saw more than one fist fight uh, settle that issue in a hurry. Um, by the time Wilma came along, something important had happened. By, when I say came along, I mean began publishing. She had lived long enough so that the first generation after World War II, the children of the Dust Bowl migrants, had been able to take advantage of the educational system in California, the promise of, of, of California, and suddenly you had their progeny becoming professionals. Suddenly you had their progeny beginning to run towns. Uh, beginning to run major corporations, be, becoming famous authors and becoming this, that, and the other. Um, and what that did was um, create an interest and it opened up the possibility of a more honest expression of the experiences that people had had when they came during the migration. There was, we all know the story of the Grapes Wrath and that it was banned in Kern County and, and that it was uh, much criticized in both sides of, 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 of the country, that is both in Oklahoma and in California, um, usually for the wrong reasons. People didn't really understand what they were talking about. But all of a sudden that was going by the wayside. And, uh, and, and here comes someone like Wilma, who becomes the spokesperson for things as they really are in the Central Valley. Uh, for migrants, in some cases, who haven't made it, or for the earlier generation of migrants. but. There is in her work such a, such a, an essential appeal to humanity, to the shared humanity of her characters, that it's difficult not to be moved by them. And so when she begins calling herself, referring to herself as an Oki, she does it in, basically in two ways. One is, of course, as a as a, a, a one-time resident and native of Oklahoma, of which she's quite proud. Uh, the other is the California sense of, of Oki, which is 
poor white usually is what people think about it from the Southwest, even though many of the migrants were not white. And uh, there were both Southerners and Southwesters, even some Midwesterners who got caught up in that stereotype. She accepts both and says, I'll show you what's best in this kind of thing. Uh, and she turns the, the, uh, the negative use of that term over. She turns it on itself and makes it a positive and indeed an admirable term. I remember she and I laughing one time about, uh, and I don't recall where we were now, maybe it was at Lamont, the Dust Bowl days, about all the people who were showing up and who were wearing jeans and cowboy boots who, you know good and well, had just gone out and bought them the day before. Because, because suddenly to be a California Okie was good. Suddenly Merle Haggard and Buck Owens had made it a positive thing. Suddenly, uh, a James E. Houston winning major awards as a novelist made it a positive thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we were kind of chuckling at that. You know, who would have thought this 30 years ago? And, uh, and so she, she worked within those labels and, and she was able to change the labels. There, there, certainly there were people who just turned their nose up even then, but they were a small minority. Uh, the other label that, that I've always found interesting was the one that Eddie Lopez gave her, Eddie Lopez, the book editor of Fresno Bee, who referred to her as the biscuits and gravy poet. Uh, Eddie meant that in the, in the kindest possible way. He, he meant, because I've talked to him about this, he meant basically that she could take elements that people did not think of as poetic and turn them into something special. Wilma, I apparently didn't take it that way because when, she, when I used that, when I repeated that expression in something I wrote about her, she chewed me out. She didn't, she didn't uh, you know, get red-faced angry, but she chewed me out. She let me know she didn't like that. She felt as though it was in some sense limiting. And I, you know, I was too smart to argue with her. I mean, it was her business, it was her name, and she didn't want, to be used, didn't want me to use it, then I wouldn't use it. Not that big a deal. But Lopez really and truly thought of that as a, as a positive thing. And he and I are still friends, I still, and he still feels that way. Once in a great while, I'll tease him a little bit about it. <laughs> Found any more gravy poets and he, he just get out of here. Uh, um, the, one of the problems of, with California as a whole, and this is something she recognized, is that the image of the state as this wealthy, glitzy place simply ignores reality. This is the richest agricultural state in the nation, the richest agricultural region in the history of the world. Somebody has to get dirty to do that work. This is one of the two or three richest petroleum producers in the United States. Somebody has to get a little oil on them now and again. Uh, people don't know the real state. Uh, she did. And so she was not worried about what, who was driving a Mercedes convertible in Beverly Hills. She was worried about who was driving a pickup in Tulare. Tulare has the largest tractor show in the world every year. Uh, and, and so she was intent upon being a Californian in the sense of the real California, not disdaining or tossing out the, the swishy stuff that's going on in San Francisco, but just saying, this is California too. Uh, you know, we, we, have, we have as much right to claim that title as anyone does, perhaps more. Because these are people who are driving one of the great economic engines, not only of California, but of the nation. That was the sense in which I think Wilma would use all of those terms. Uh, to go back to what started this, I think she was, she was always proud to be with the San Joaquin Valley. Because the San Joaquin Valley, is, if there is such a thing, is California's southwest. It's where a high percentage of the population of all colors has come from Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Missouri, uh, Nebraska, uh, Southern Colorado. And, uh, you know, I was raised in a little town, we used to laugh about this because we were both, both Wilma and I were Catholics, which is not that common for Southwesterners in this state at least. That's because my mother was a Californian. But uh, I told her that in Oildale, where I was raised, there were 16 churches, all of them Pentecostal. There was no Catholic church. So I grew up thinking that Catholicism was a little splitter sect next to the Assembly of God and the Church of the Nazarene, the Four Square Gospel, and on and on and on. Uh, and, she, and she laughed at that. She thought that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, but that was just something about where we were from. And, uh, and where are you from? There's a degree in which place helps write your work for you. 
if you're open to it, because the place brings with it qualities and, uh, and, and habits that can be employed in, uh, in literature quite meaningfully. And she understood all of that. She knew what she was reflecting. So I'll stop. I'll stop getting off into a sermon there. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what about music? She writes about music. She sometimes um, talks about hearing music at the, at the fair, which was across the street from her apartment. Yeah. Um, and when you've talked a little bit, you talked about the, the Crystal Palace and, you know, and the poem that she wrote about Buck and, and you were there when, when he read that. Did you look at her when he was I couldn't see her. Reading? I was trying oh, you to. Because he pointed, he pointed. She was up uh, on a level above the dance floor. Uh -huh. And he pointed, but it was the dance floor was illuminated and the bandstand was illuminated. But where we were all sitting was not illuminated. And, uh, and I could not see her for the world. I, 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 <laughs> I, I would love to have seen her because I, I, knew she, I, I think knowing her, I bet she was just chuckling. Did you ever talk with her about it? Like oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, what did she yeah, say? Yeah. Oh, she just thought that was wonderful. She <laughs> laughed, and she told everybody about it. I mean, everybody. Uh, I can't think of when. when I was in Tulare, but I, I, can't, I can't think of her. No, I was in Visalia. I was doing I was doing a reading at a bookstore there. And she and Betty showed up, and we we uh, and they had mis they had misadvertised the reading. They'd advertised it for one o'clock and told me it was at eleven, so we had a couple hours to kill. <laughs> yeah. And so we sat there, and that's where we talked about it. And, uh -huh. and she just got the biggest kick out of that. She loved book poems. And she loved music to begin with, and uh, and and she and she she also understood that, that music had been in fact the sung poetry of the migration. That at a time when there were not people like Wilma McDaniel publishing books, you still had a you still had a Woody Guthrie or you still had a Fred Maddox or um, someone Bill Woods who was writing songs with lyrics that were true that you felt felt were important. And we used to laugh about some of the songs. There was one old song called uh, "Hey Oki, Have You Seen Arky?" Telling Texas found a job out in California picking up prunes, squeezing oil out of olives. We laugh at that. I don't remember who sang that, but I, I grew up with that as a kid. I thought it was a wonderful song. Uh, but then there was another very famous song called Oogie Boogie. And again, these songs are, what, what I loved about them was that they were spitting in the eye of California. The people who were uh, bigoted against Southwesterners were getting it right back. Uh, and there, were, there was just a whole series of them. Bob Wills was a big, big favorite. He came out and he lived in Fresno for a long time, then lived in Sacramento. And uh, I think for, for many of us in my generation, I was born in 37, in my generation, he was, uh, he was probably the most important performer from the Southwest. And our folks, my folks would go to the Bakersfield Barn to dance and hear him play. There was also Fresno Barn, there was a Sacramento Barn. And if, and if you didn't like Dust Bowlers, you better stay the hell out of those places <laughs> because they were not gonna listen to any stuff. Uh, and we, so we talked about that, how important this was. And people uh, like Smiley Maxedon, who nobody ever heard of unless they lived in Tulare. But Smiley was very important to Tulare. And then the people who made it big, like Jean Shepard, who was a, a girl from the, the Tulare Visalia area, who became a Grand Ole Opry performer. And we all remember, we saw these people, you know, I was just a kid. And she was, the woman was an adult by then, of course, but we, we saw them, they performed at the county fairs. They were just getting started. So that the music represented uh, a sort of uh, respected area of cultural continuity. It was a place where you could go and you, and you could experience the old country in the same way that an Italian or an Irishman or, or might do the same thing. And again, it was it was not just whites. I mean, there, there were a lot of black musicians profoundly influenced by the Southwest who were performing in those days, and Indian mixes and black Indian mixes and white Indian black mixes mixes and so on and so forth. Um, that, the, the music and the lyrics transcended where you were very often for people. And I think they, it gives a certain um, freedom to a, someone who's a writer to listen to, to, to music being sung, because uh, lyrics being sung, because what you've got to do then if you're Roman Book Daniel is you've got to provide the music without an instrument other than your pencil. And a really fine poet can do that. 
Uh, you know, as I write prose, that's because I can't do it. <laughs> she could and did. Um, so I think she was very much influenced. And I, I mean, I can remember we talked talking about the Maddox Brothers and Rose because they were, this was a Southwestern group, or actually Southern group, but who were seen in Southwestern, who were based in, in Modesto, but became, you know, played the Louisiana Hayride, Grand Ole Opry, and it became a major group. But they were absolutely hilarious, and, and, and everybody loved them. And uh, uh, when they performed, uh, you never knew what was going to happen. And uh, I mean, they would be off the bandstand, and they were, there was one who, who frequently got in fights with the audience, calling Friendly Henry. But, and, and so we would laugh about this, and, and Fred Maddox, who was the, the real clown in the, in the group. Uh, I, last time I saw them perform, I was a kid, I, uh, I saw Rose Maddox perform as an adult, but when I was a kid, was they were on the back of a hay trailer in a park in Bakersfield. And, you know, and hundreds of people, just all in a big circle around there. And we almost saw them in those kind of situations. So, you know, when you come from an area that, that has produced the, 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 the Gene Shepherds and the Furlan Huskies and the Bob Owens and the Merle Haggards and the Bandix Brothers and Rose, music is very important to you. I don't think it cannot help but be but I think, oh, she, by the way, really admired the lyrics of Merle Haggard. She could see the poetry in his lyrics. Um, and I know she did a Woody Guthrie as well. But I know that, I, I used to tell her that I thought that, that Haggard was the best contemporary, uh, in my generation, the best bard, the best, the best singing poet uh, in any form. And she pretty well agreed with me on that. Mm -hmm. uh, because he just, he does what she does. You know, he, he writes a, a, a a, a lyric like I'm shopping for dresses with no one to wear them. I mean that's not a common perspective, and that's he, and he touches the same kind of things that she touches on. You know the, the same kind of uh, uh, hard scrabble life lived with dignity. So um, yeah, I, mean, I think I think it's hard to understand these people if you don't understand something about the about the music. Did she talk about Woody Guthrie? Did you have conversations about Woody? We talked Any? about him only briefly, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, Woody Guthrie, it's a, he's in an interesting situation. He, he is in some ways over uh, estimated for his impact in California. That is, Woody was always far more famous in the salons of Berkeley than in the saloons of Bakersfield. Um, his cousin Jack Guthrie was very well known. Uh, Oklahoma Hills, where I was born, and others. But, uh, but, but Woody became very, very famous because he got adopt, adopted by the, by the uh, academia uh, for, the, for his political songs in the late 30s, early 40s. But I, what, what I asked her about, I remember asking this because I was, when I was writing about, uh, about country music, I wondered if she had heard the old Lefty Lou Christmas Woody Guthrie radio programs from L.A. in the late 40s, 30s and early 40s. She had not. But she, but she certainly knew who he was. She not, she, as I recall, she had not heard of Lefty Lou Christmas. Hmm. But uh, uh, and so, so I may be, in my view of this, may be distorted because I'm of a different generation. Uh, I don't remember anybody ever even talking about Woody Guthrie in my family. I do remember Jack Guthrie, uh, but I then when I got to college, so he was the only person they were talking about. So. Uh, whereas Wilma, who was actually there because she was an adult when this was going, might have might have had vivid memories of him, but we never talked about that particular thing. Uh, and we both admired his songs, and we both thought "This Land Is Your Land" should be the national anthem. Mm -hmm. We agreed on that. <laughs> who were her favorites? Did she ever talk about the Red Dirt Rangers? She corresponded with a couple of those guys. She, she mentioned it, but she didn't ever yeah. pursue it to any extent. Okay. I, don't re I don't recall, uh, other than just one or two times talking about, about that. Uh-huh. Okay. Let me tell you a story that just all pops in my mind that I would have forgotten to tell you that I think is really funny. Um, I have a buddy who's a, who's a Dust Bowl migrant. Well, I have many buddies who are Dust Bowl But I have one in particular, one of my best friends, Kenny uh, Byron. And Ken is an attorney in Bakersfield. And he has, his, 
uh, his family actually uh, Texas to Arkansas, uh, Texas to Arizona to California, kind of one of the classic routes. Same thing Buck Owens did exactly, but uh, but Kenny uh, uh, fell in love with. I, I I was giving out one book dang books to all my friends. In fact, I did that through most of the last half of my life. Uh, but I gave one to Ken, and and he read the poem about the egg sucking dog. And I can't remember. I I, can't, I wish I could give it to you for Vegas, but I can't. But he just he he loved the whole thing. But that got him going. So we were out at we, we were out at the dust bowl days, and Ken, and Ken and Pam and my wife Jen and I went out. And Wilma was there, and so I said, "Come on, I'm gonna do shit to Wilma because he really wanted to meet it." So I, I I took him over there. This Ken is bold as a gopher snake. Probably why he's such a successful attorney. So before I can introduce him, he puts his arm around her and says, "You old egg sucking dog." <laughs> Hey, what are you doing here? And she looked at him. <laughs> yeah, I introduced him, and then and then they both started laughing. Well, from that point on, every time he'd see her, or vice, or, or vice versa, the egg sucking dog would come up. And the last time I talked to her, and I can't even remember where I was now, uh, I was in, I think it was in Visalia when I was doing that reading. She would all she would say to me every time. Have you seen that old egg sucking dog? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's <a> good. <laughs> uh, another uh, writer who was um, a Dust Bowl poet is Dorothy Rose. Mm -hmm. um, could you just. Excuse me. Okay. Maybe compare. Dorothy with Wilma, just a bit. I don't. I don't think Dorothy had the uh, what's the word? The genius that Wilma had. She was. A, she was and is a good poet, a solid poet. But but for me, uh, her poetry lacked the magic. And there's no other way that for me to say it. And I don't want to be insulting because I admire I, anybody who, who gets in those trenches and does the work I admire, period, because I've been there myself. Uh, but if I had, had to, to characterize the difference, it, was, it would be that, that there was almost something predictable in, in the structures and the observations. She was a little more sentimental, uh, but, but she was not a not a bad poet, I sure don't mean that. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's hard to talk about because you're talking about degrees here, but, but there was something in Wilma's work that was totally unlike anyone else's. Totally unlike anyone else's. I didn't feel that way about Dorothy's. Dorothy's content was often different, but the structure is what I'm referring to here. Tended to be closer to conventional, let's put it that way, than, uh, than Wilma's. Wilma's was just totally off the wall, which is exactly why I liked it so well. Um, but I think Dorothy is it was it is was a good a good solid writer, and uh, I'm glad she wrote. I wish there were more people doing it because I think the more voices you have, the closer you you are to the reality that produced all of them. Because uh, finally, Wilma's view is just Wilma's view. You get, you get down to that. There's a degree of universality, but it's still one writer's view. So if you got a hundred writers with each with one writer's view, then you have a better possibility. Of understanding the complexity and the, and the, the tone and texture of that, that life. I think my favorite dust writer whose family could be called dust poet would be the novelist James D. Houston, who is best known in, to a lot of people uh, for writing Farewell to Manzanar with his wife Jean. But Jim was a wonderful novelist. And if you read a book like The Men in My Life or Three Songs from My Father, uh, I mean, this, this, this is right out of the roots of, of a South, a, 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 in his case, Texas family transplanted to California and, and, and what they've had to do and the values they keep. He talks about how uh, uh, he loved music and his family went to the Church of Christ. And so he went to his uncle who was a deacon and he, he wanted to know if, if he could bring a guitar or something to, to church. And his, and his uh, and his uncle said, or no, yeah, he, I beg your he, he wanted, wanted them to play a piano in church. That was what it was. The guitar is another story. And then uh, he said, his uncle looked at him and said, Jimmy, if you can show me in the Bible 
where they mention it by piano. We'll sure have one. But if you can't, don't bring no piano in this church. <laughs> <laughs> Wilma loved that story. He and Wilma were very, really hit it off. And they, when they were together, it was fun to listen to. Even a motor mouth like me would shut up because I just wanted to hear those two together. They both were, they were anecdotal and, and each could see the humor in one another's lives. And it was, it was fun. It was great fun to, to be with them. Could you tell me a little bit about um, the memorial service that was given for Wilma? Yeah, that was a, uh, Wilma's, uh, Funeral, internment, and memorial was was uh, was very moving and yet I think appropriately uh, satisfying. Uh, she was buried in a uh, out of a Catholic church, a little mission church in Tulare. You know, in, in the in the Central Valley during the time of racial segregation, which was until after World War II. Um, they would sometimes the Catholic parishes would not. Uh, welcome the Latinos into the church. And what they would do was build little missions in the Latino district. So it would be like a mini church controlled by the Catholic parish in which the uh, sometimes the masses were done in Spanish, but always it was where the, where the Latinos were, were more welcome than they would be at the, with the, the burgers. People forget California has its racist history too, in, in spades I might add. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, and so she was buried out of a little mission church, and she was wearing her Franciscan robes in the coffin. Uh, she was a lay nun in the Franciscan order. Um, and then, and, they, and, and, a, and a mass was done, and, and for folks who are members of that faith, such as I, the, uh, the, that, the, it's inherently comforting to know that someone uh, has, has joined their savior. Well, then we proceeded to the, to the cemetery, and again, the, 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 it, it, it ends there with the internment and all this putting a handful of earth on the coffin. By this time, we're, a lot of us are pretty, pretty low and semi-weepy because we knew we weren't going to see her anymore, although uh, we felt good about the way she was, she was being laid to rest. And we repaired to the museum, and at the museum there were uh, snacks, and people got up and, and gave uh, testimonials, uh, anecdotes, and I thought it was really very interesting because even though I had known her by that time for oh over 30 years and had to have some wonderful times together with her, I really didn't know the, the uh, totality of her life. And I, think, and I was sitting with the people I know pretty well, uh, and I think that most of us had that same sensation that, that there were dimensions to her, there were parts of her life of, well I heard just what I was just talking about, just her, her uh, faith in the Catholic Church and how actively she pursued it, that she was actually a lay nun, uh, wasn't, it wasn't uh, something that was at the forefront of what she was saying. I mean she, she wrote a lot of religious poetry and, and see, the Bible was a major source of her inspiration and indeed I think of their discipline. But, uh, but as people got up and they began to talk and, and uh, often laugh, occasionally weep, I began to see a, a, a far more complete picture of, of, of this remarkable person. And I think the fact that she was remarkable, everybody's remarkable, but not everybody is no, noticed as being remarkable. And, and the fact that she was remarkable, you could see as these presentations went on, it was very, very comforting to, to most of us who were there. Um, there were some some, some funny things said, there were some not so funny things said. Um, I know I was sitting with uh, the, the librarian from South Pasadena, Steve Fjellstead, and he would poke me every once in a while and say, do you know that? Do you know that? And the answer was, I usually did not know that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I found, it, I found it comforting because it was a community saying goodbye to someone who had been special to the community, somebody who had given the, given the community uh, a special place. You know, Tulare is, is an interesting place in that it, it has produced some unusual people. It's produ it produced a double Olympic champion, for example, in track and field, 
and it's produced uh, some very interesting entertainers, but uh, writers are not, not something you've seen a lot from that particular area so far. Uh, and the woman is, is, is the, the creme de la creme, uh, and, and the community knew that. There were dignitaries there, uh, and uh, I know when we drove away, and I walked out to the, the car with Steve and uh, I think Trudy, and uh, we all felt as though it had been a good send off. You know, we're going to have to, all of us are going to be gone sometime, and this was as good a send off as we could have managed. Uh, I think she would have been happy with it. She probably probably would have been embarrassed about some of the stories we told, <laughs> but that's okay. That's that's what the, what it's about. She was a wonderfully candid person, and uh, would uh, could crack a grin with the best of them. You talked about her um, influence into Larry, and I know that that she didn't write to receive awards or honors or anything. But are you aware of any that she did receive in particular? Really not. I know she has some certificates of appreciation from things like the, the Tulare County and, and so on, but I'm not aware of, of, uh, of that. Um, there's a lot of um, well, things like pushcart prizes, as they're called, where, where a, a, poem, a poem is nominated and then can be selected and put in this anthology of small press work every year. I think she was. She had a couple of those, if I'm not mistaken. I could be mistaken, though. But she didn't talk about this. You know, there wasn't mm -hmm. anything anybody talked about. I mean, I think in the writing world, um, awards are good to the to the extent that they get your books into circulation, that they prompt readers to pick them up. And but beyond that, they don't really mean much because they're all arbitrary. Mm -hmm. and all of us know that. Uh, I, have, I remember Gary Gary Sotos. Uh, <laughs> Talking about being a National Book Award finalist, which I think I think the National Book Award is the highest literary award in the United States, and uh, uh, and him saying, "Yeah, it was really a great honor," but uh, you know, how do you really know that these are the four top? <laughs> and that's the truth. You don't. You know, it's it's pretty arbitrary. Your chances are a whole lot better if they're published in New York than if they're published in Bakersfield or Tulare. I can guarantee you. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to sell books, you need to go on Oprah, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about the best way to do it. She, you know, it's funny that when she did do a few readings, the ones that I was, she was wonderful. I mean, she, it wasn't that she was expressive. It wasn't that she that she performed the way a lot of folks do. You know, Mas mm -hmm. Masumoto is one of the most interesting uh, poets to see uh, read because he performs, and he's just and he's good. He's you know, very good. He's a good writer. Uh, Whereas Wilma would read, would just read, but there was something about her that the, the, almost the austerity, the, except you, there, there's all, there was the edge of impishness all the time in the austerity, and you didn't have to know her very well to know that to recognize it, the twinkle in the eye, and uh, so I wish she had done more reading. I think she would have. I think places like universities would have been just bowled over by her. I mean, mm -hmm. Kids would not know what to think about somebody who you know, looks like a, a Grant Wood character standing there reading these outrageous poems. Uh, I, I run into, because of, of, of where I live and what I do, I run into all kinds of poets and I find that there are far more of them who are outrageous in their behavior and in their appearance than they are in their writing. The writing just doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> where she was the opposite. Her writing was just out there. Uh, did she did she give commentary on uh, when she read? Did she comment on the poems before she read them or afterward, or did she just read? When what I saw, she did not do much commentary. Mm -hmm. and, and I, someone like Lillian or you know, or or, or uh, or whomever would, would might be able to give you a better answer for that because I only saw her, I only saw her read a couple mm -hmm. of times, simply because I'm another part of the state, but. Uh, but you know, she, she, the, often there's a question and answer period that follows the reading, and then she would comment. But I don't recall her explaining. I remember tell, talking to her about I, about about this. And what my one of my uh, premises is: if you have to explain a work you haven't finished writing it, you, you better you better go back and work on it some more. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to understand every little nuance. It just means that it, the work better stand by itself. You can't be with it every place it goes. And she was in full agreement with that. She mm -hmm. laughed about it. 
Were there types of questions that she resented in any capacity in particular? I never heard that, but it was, again, it's, you know, I'm sure you can always come up with something. Mm -hmm. Maybe if somebody called her the, the gravy, are you really the gravy poet? <laughs> <laughs> the biscuits and gravy. She, she narrowed it down to the gravy poet. She was, you know, it started as the biscuits and gravy poet, but by the end when she would mention it, it would be the gravy poet. <laughs> I, don't know, I still don't know what that's all about. Uh, I've seen a copy of that article, by the way. She actually sent a copy of that article to uh, Oklahoma, <laughs> to one of her yeah, uh, well, correspondences in Oklahoma. Yeah. But she did, I think she, I've read that uh, she sent that, but then she also said, don't call me the gravy poet or something, you yeah. know. You know, here's this article about me, but don't, <laughs> yeah, don't call me don't this. Quote it. Yeah. Well, as I said, I, I, I know the guy who wrote it, and I know that what his intent was. Yeah. But you know, any of us who do any writing know that your intent is not always your accomplishment. So it's just what happens. In the right. Mm -hmm. Did you bring any... Um, any of her works that you would like to read? Hey, I have a couple here okay. that, that I like. Um, these are just, uh, these are, I like, I tend to actually tend to like her earlier work better than her later work. I, I alluded to that earlier mm -hmm. because I, I don't think she was, I don't think she had, had come to think of herself quite uh, as a poet you know, in the professional sense. And so there was a, she got closer to the case. Um, here, by visiting a neighbor in a hospital. We found old Jarlath lying in bed with tubes in both his skinny arms. The first thing he said was, I know how them poor boys feels when they get locked up in jail. When I come in here yesterday, the nurse taken my temperature and they drawed some blood. And then they taken my pants away and left me a prisoner. Now, I like that. It really can't be. I used to sit around listening to my grandfather and these other old guys talk and that's exactly the way they talk. It sounds, it, it, has, it captures the, the sense of, the, of those conversations. Um, young Widow. Bonnie came home from Dub's funeral, put his memory book on the television set and started making an ice cream. None of the mourners could stop her. She stood at the sink in high heels, beating eggs with milk and sugar, measured vanilla without a spoon, never spattered one drop on her black dress. I, I mean, I, how do I even top that? It's just, mm -hmm. it's, the, everything is there that needs to be there and nothing is there that doesn't need to be there, to me. Mm -hmm. So I think of that as being poetry for very high, a very high level. Um, revival. Blue bib overalls are passing away, except on Tuesdays, plugged by tobacco, starch with sweat, they revive in Tulare and make a stand at the public auction. Walking stiffly, they prod bull calves with arthritic canes. Uh, but I guess my, my favorite one, because it links uh, California and Oklahoma in such a visceral way, is Buried Treasure, which is one that gets reprinted a lot. L.B. Hayes ruined his expensive shoes squashing around the autumn desolation of the sharecrop farm in Caddo County. Oaky boy turned 50, searching for anything that had belonged to his father when he was fighting the Great Depression. Kicked at a lump behind the caved-in cellar and uncovered a rusty Prince Albert can, stowed it away as he would a saint's bones in his Lincoln Continental, and headed back to Baker City. I love that he's done well. I got Lincoln Continental. <laughs> <laughs> so those are just a few of them that I really like. And I, you can see, I, I tend to like the ones that are that are almost like person uh, sketches of characters. Mm -hmm. This tends to be my taste. Mm -hmm. um, and it's some of the very early ones I like a lot. The ones that, 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 that where everything kind of turns, and you all of a sudden you're in a different dimension. Uh, these, these three in here uh, are leftovers. Uh, Letter to Cleotis, which is one of the first ones that I ever read and closed by her, are, are that. They, they kind of turn, and all of a sudden the meaning is not quite what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a real mark of her skill. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can teach people to make those kinds of observations. You know, I don't think a creative writing class can teach that. That you can hope that people will develop it by reading this, they'll start doing it. And uh, you can teach them how to use a semicolon. 
That's not the same thing. That's easy. How has her writing influenced you? Well, I think it, 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 it freed me up. I, before I ever met her, I, I published Okies, which is a, a, a collection of story about California Okies, the Dust Bowl migrants in California in the period of time. Actually, there's one that's set before World War II. All the other stories are set after World War II at the time when, the, when things were changing, getting better. Uh, and I, I used a lot of, uh, of uh, dialect, dialectic prose, and uh, got some criticism for it. Uh, people who, you know, said, well, that's not how Californians talk, that's how Southerners talk. And I thought, well, you don't know, where, you don't know California that I'm from. And when I started reading Wilma, and I realized she was doing the same thing, maybe doing it better, but doing the same thing, it really freed me up. I just thought, what the heck, poo on these people, I'll do, do what, I, what I please. <laughs> and I actually started writing, and uh, I wrote, a, after that book, I started putting in every collection I wrote, no matter what, what the, the source of the stories, I published eight short story collections after that. And uh, the, uh, there's a Tahoe Club Gang story. The Tahoe Club Gang are a bunch of guys who hang out at a bar in Oildale, which is my old hometown. And, and I use the name of a real bar, the Tahoe Club, because it's where my dad and his buddies met at these all oil workers would meet after work and created this cast of characters who are just like the characters in her, in her uh, poems. And she got the biggest kick out of that. And the first one, for example, is called The Great Kern County Gator Hunt. And it's about a, 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 a guy who, uh, an old Arky who, uh, tricks these, these beer-swilling he-men into thinking there's a, there's a wild alligator in the Kern River. <laughs> and they go out hunting for it in the middle of the night, three sheets to the wind. And all the stories are like that. They're kind of nonsense stories. And uh, she loved those. And, and because she, she drew on the same kind of thing. And, uh, but she did it far more, in a far more concise and probably far more effective way. Um, but just, just seeing somebody using the material as, as well as she used it made me think it, it was well worth staying with it. There's no point in abandoning it no matter what the critics said. Because by then I was starting to get stuff written about my work too. And occasionally you get this, you know, this guy would write about important things like New York. Uh, the, 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 this would be finer. Middle class angst. I was, well, I was more interested in blue collar angst. And uh, she was too. Uh, so I guess just in that sense, I don't think there's anything, because we, you know, by the time we got to know one another, we were both already into our careers, I guess is what you'd have to say. I, would, I was already about three books in, and uh, I wasn't about to, and I knew the direction I wanted to go, but she, but she certainly reinforced some impulses that I had. And I think I, tr I tried to listen more closely because she clearly had that ear, and I thought, you need that ear to, to, to make people sound the way they actually sound, make it, make it appear to the reader that they're dealing with the genuine language of these folks. Did you purposely, um, you touched on this earlier, but I want to make sure I get it in the interview. Did you purposely try to try to help promote Wilma, sure. her, her writing? Yeah, what were the ways that you did that? Well, I wrote about her and I talked about her. I used her work in classes and you know included it in anthologies that I edited. I recommended it to other writers. I just, as a matter of fact, a couple weeks ago there, uh, the, my listing in Poets and Writers, the directory of American uh, Poets and Fiction Writers, uh, they, they, they added some questions, who are your favorite writers, who are your this, who are your that, well she's listed as one of my favorite writers. Uh, uh, because she was, I, mean, I, wasn't, I didn't have to contrive that, I thought of her as being someone really different, really special. And, uh, and I thought there was, I think young writers in particular could learn a lot from her, and that's just to be genuine. You don't have to be contrived. I think when you start off to be a writer, there's a real tendency to imitate and be quite contrived. Uh, if, you're, if you're going, you know, the normal literary pattern, you read all your Hemingway, you read all your Faulkner, you read all your Fitzgerald, and then you move up to the next generation, and, you know, on and on and on. Uh, and, and someone like her, who didn't do that, you know, uh, and, and was able to draw the stuff of literature just from her surroundings, is an eye opener for young writers and uh, so yeah absolutely any anytime I had a chance to, to recommend her I did and that wasn't just me by the way that there there, there was a there, sort of a, a group of us and again I mentioned Houston Paul Foreman down in Texas would be another one uh, who, who uh, tried to help one another's out uh, 
because each of us had somewhat different audiences. And you know, I, and, and, and I could mention Wilma's work to people, some of whom wouldn't have heard of her, and Houston could mention that would be another somewhat different group. And you know, the circles would come together in certain areas, but out in the periphery there were readers who would be new to each of these other writers. And uh, uh, Art Quayle was one of those folks who was involved in that. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a real sense among the, the sort of alternative press writers, you know, most of my books have been published by university presses, uh, not all, but most. Um, and the alternative press writers, you have, to help, you have to help one another because no one's going to help you. There is no publicity machine. Wilma well, didn't have a publicity machine. Mm -hmm. But she had people who loved her work and were, and were fond of her. And uh, so it was the least she could do. Uh, it's, it, as they say, it's no skin off anybody's nose. What, uh, because, uh, well, because I think that she's well known, or more well, much more well known in California than in Oklahoma. What do you think um, people in Oklahoma need to know about her? Well, she was an absolute, straightforward, honest writer uh, who was proud of her, of her Oklahoma roots and who often mingled the two as she just did in Buried Treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's a good model for writers who, who, who think that they're going to have to conform to the, the style that they see in books coming from this major capital or that major capital. Uh, one of the things that she provided, I remember talking to a kid when I was in community college back in Bakersfield, you know, 50 years ago, and there was a kid there who was, who was thought to be a, a very bright, very promising kid, and he kept saying, you know, if I could just get to San Francisco, I know I could write a novel. Well, what she proved is you don't have to go to San Francisco or Paris or London or New York. All you have to do is be observant and develop some work habits. And, and she did both. You know, she found the time to write every single day, as she told me. And, uh, and, and, and she found the material right there. In fact, one of the things that I think some of us have done, when we did, I did, Jim did, is, 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 to, is to contrast the Californias. And I would use that as a, as a source of humor or tension in the work. And, uh, uh, and so, one of the things that she, someone in Oklahoma could do is they could talk about the difference between living in, in the rural part of the state, the small town, farm town, and somebody, it's an intellectual in Norman or Stillwater. Because um, there's going to be a difference, there's going to be a big difference. One of the things you're going to have at the, at the university, you're going to have people who don't want to be there. We're hoping that Columbia will call tomorrow or Cal will call tomorrow. And, that gets, and then that tension, you know, people who, who, whose blood and bones are invested in the land, uh, and would no more think of leaving uh, short of death than anything. Uh, there you go. I mean, so I, I would think with, with what Wilma says to a good young writer, to a to a, a, a new writer, not a young writer, you can be old and be a, a new writer, is look around you, look, find out what's really there, uh, you know, trust and trust that, trust yourself, trust your judgment about these things. Uh, I think that's a, that would be a message for any writer anywhere, but since she has drawn on that material herself, has already kind of knocked down a few fences, uh, I would think that would be a place to go. That really... How should she be remembered, if you had to try to sum that up? Well, I think she was an original, honest writer who brought us a vision that we did not have in American literature. Um, and as a result of that, she's expanded everybody else's uh, possibilities. And that's what every writer of, of significance does, as far as I'm concerned. I think she's actually done that. I think she's underappreciated. She's underread at this point, but I'm not sure that's always going to be the case. Uh, she's also a product of something else that goes on in all American literature, and that's the, the, the that I mentioned just a moment ago talking about young writers from Oklahoma, that is the ongoing tension between the, the, the urban and rural. And, and she's really in kind of the mid-ground there. Tulare is not really urban in the sense that a, a major city is, and yet it's also not rural. It isn't it's, Stroud, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's adjacent to rural, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's uh, raison d'entre is rural. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, 
it's a great, is that the second, isn't it, that's the second most productive county, agriculture county in the United States. Fresno County is the most. So I mean, you're dealing with, with something that's very special. But, uh, but, there, but there's that tension, and there's all, another kind of tension that it seems to me is, is there for the reader. It, she's writing about people and places and times that many of them are going to be unfamiliar with. So the challenge for her as a writer is to make it interesting to people who don't have roots in Oklahoma or California or the rural or the city, uh, people who are a generation past that. You know, when I, when I used to tell people that when I retired from the university here, the reason I retired was that not only did people not know, students not know what World War II was, they didn't, they didn't know what Vietnam was either. At that point, it was time for me to get out. Because <laughs> my frames of reference were no longer appropriate. <laughs> and, 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 and she, you know, she has to, to stride through that garden herself, but she does it. And the way a writer does that, I think, is write so well about what they do know that they compel the reader to, to come and challenge it, to, to, to take it on. And, uh, and I, think she, I think she's good enough and original enough that she does that at her best. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? Well, I hope anybody who observes this interview and hasn't read Woman of Daniel will at least pick up one book, just one, and, uh, and then make a decision. I think I know what the decision will be. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do, how do we get the uh, word out more about her? I think doing what you're doing, but I think publication. You know, for example, you, you, you have, I'm sure you must have a university magazine. Um, mm -hmm. Well, the way I would do it for that, because they're going to have to have some, some university connection, is I would talk about this project. Mm -hmm. But I would make sure there were two or three samples of, of her poems there that people would, so they could actually read the poems. And then maybe one or two quotes from people like Robert Peters or, or mm -hmm. whomever. Jim Houston had a couple good quotes about her. Just saying, hey, this is something special. Don't miss it. And you, you can quote me. This is something special. Don't miss it. <laughs> you know, it's not like Oklahoma mm -hmm. uh, is, is, has, has poets, major poets dropping off the trees in there, or California. Uh -huh. or, I mean, and so when you get someone like this, you want to take advantage of them. And, and then find out where the next young poet goes. You know, one thing I might do if I were a wealthy man or a rich man, <laughs> I think I'll patent that, uh, <laughs> is, is put together a Willow Daniel Prize for poetry. Uh, and you know, for Oklahoma writers, young Oklahoma writers, or they wouldn't have to be young, just be, you know, un, people who have not had a volume of poetry published. Uh -huh. are, you a, are you familiar with the Literary Landmarks Project? Uh, no, I'm not. We'll have to talk about that. We'll do that off the can. Um, yeah, I don't need to put it in yeah. here, but I can tell you a little bit okay. about that. That's. I think that might be another thing that we need to look at doing for her. Um, as far as the website goes, that um, that we've created at the library to try to help preserve her legacy. Uh, have you taken a look at that? I look at. It. I have okay. Not you dug through it. Well, we're still, there's still much more content to add to that, of yeah. course, but um, I mean, for one thing, I, I want to honor her memory with that and, and be respectful of her and what she did and um, also introduce people to her, um, help preserve her legacy and let it be a place that people can go to learn more about her and where they can learn where things are about her. Uh, so we, we want to collaborate with a lot of other places, you know, that have collections, you know, and maybe we can put their guide to their collection up, you know, that kind of thing. But for people who are doing research about her, what, what is important to include in this type of project, this website, that can help researchers? Well, uh, obviously, you're, you're, you've got the biographical material. You've got the bibliography as to the extent that you can have it. Yeah, I would make it as extensive as I could. Mm -hmm. In fact, I might even use her uh, as a way to talk about the alternative press movement in the United States, which has produced everybody from Walt Whitman to Woman McDaniel. Some people forget about that. They just think about New York. 
Um, and uh, look at the International Directory of Small Presses and Little Magazines, you find 5,800 different listings. Um, a bibliography of works about her, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, secondary, what they call secondary bibliography. Um, it, I think you've already touched on this, maybe this is what the Literary Landmarks is about, but something about the places she wrote about and wrote from. I would do something about the, the link between uh, Oklahoma, the culture of Oklahoma, and the culture of California, particularly the, the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's interesting that uh, if you if you ask in the world of country music, the best known Oki would be Merle Haggard, by far it wouldn't be, it would be close. And he was born in California. <laughs> I, you know, I'm that's interesting. I'm not so sure that Oklahoma would would say that. In country music, I think I think you know that that would be true. But I'd be you know because I, I, I did this when I was in yeah. Nashville and places. And I, and I would have to say, wait a minute, he's not from Oklahoma. And they would be kind of shocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's a certain um, there's a certain group in Oklahoma that would tell you Woody Guthrie because mm -hmm. there's a, a genre of music called Red Dirt music that is based in Oklahoma, and there are a lot of influences in it, and they don't really like to try to pin it down into any one thing. Certainly country is, is a, a big part of the influence, yeah. but... For those guys that play and sing that music, that original music, and Bob Childers is, they consider him the godfather of, of Red Bear music, and and and, they're, and really a lot of it originated in the Stillwater area. And then you have the Tulsa sound too, of course, which I'm sure you're familiar Bob with. Bob Wills. Bob Wills, but then Leon Russell is from Tulsa, yeah. you know, and, and that kind of thing. So a lot of the, a lot of the people my age, you know, that are that are playing mm -hmm. Oklahoma regional music now are tracing it directly to Woody because of um, some of their um, their social beliefs and um, just their, their, their sharing and their, you know, they're freely giving and they're writing about their place and, and that kind of thing. Just as a quick aside, you mentioned social beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's an interesting area of uh, uh, Wilma was, was profoundly egalitarian, it, it has always seemed to me, and, and uh, uh, would not, but not egalitarian in the way in which uh, the, 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 the campus egalitarians would be, you know, the SDS or the whomever, you know, the, the, the groups that, that uh, uh, protested for, for ethnic studies, say, and things of that kind. It wasn't that, wasn't that edge to it. But there was there was a she was was egalitarian uh, in the sense that she she respected really and truly did respect all people. She understood that people were going through the same things. What I would call mature kind of egalitarianism. What we saw on campus here, California, as we come down for, was uh, you remember the old expression "power to the people." Well, it only referred to the people you agreed with. Mm -hmm. If you were on campus, Wilma wasn't that way. She mm -hmm. didn't have that notion. She she was just a more open person. She found people not to like. Don't misunderstand me, but uh, but the, I hadn't even thought much about that. I don't. We never really talked about social consciousness in the in the Woody Guthrie sense of that word. Uh, I don't remember ever having a conversation with her about that. That would be kind of interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. I know she knew. I mean, she read, and uh, but but I I don't know. But as I said, out here, as I mentioned earlier about Guthrie, out here he's he's strictly a kind of a college phenomenon, mm -hmm. yeah. Where the not that people don't admire him, they right? Do, but, yeah. but 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 his reputation has been well. That gets back in the history of country music, where country music, where a leftist kind of country music suddenly becomes what's called folk music, and it's the very same stuff that was country music five years before. It's just that suddenly the political break occurs. And what happened? What happened out here is is just that. All of a sudden, you've got people singing what um, the Carter fan become folk singers instead of West, country western singers. Although they start as country western singers mm -hmm. uh, and things of that kind. I've always, when I teach the uh, the course on 
uh, country music in California, I always make it clear that to me, uh, folk and country rock and western swing and on and on, cow punk, that's all country as far as I'm concerned. It, you know, it, it all comes from the same source and we, we can hang all the labels we want on it, mm -hmm. but I'm not kicking anything out. I don't feel like it's my role to do that. There are people who do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so Guthrie is very much, oh, yeah. Guthrie is very much uh, in, in, in that thing, in the coast for that festival one year, about three years ago, I guess it was. And we were, you, you, you drop over the coast range and you get over, there's a grade called Grocer Grade, and you, and you drop down into the valley near a little town called Maricopa. Mm -hmm. And we got at the top of that grade, and it looked like we were driving into a bowl of stew. I mean, it, I can't tell you how awful it was. Mm -hmm. It's weird. We were going to spend a couple of days there and visit old friends. And as soon as the, we finished the Dust Bowl Festival, we went right back to the coast. Oh, I know. July and August, when you, when you step outside, it can just suck the breath out of you, yeah. you know, sometimes. Um, although it's, that can be a good feeling, too, sometimes, you know, just having that extreme, you know, temperature yeah. shock to your system sort of we used to talk about my wife and i about how I, we used to we we talk about occasionally because what it was like to grow up down there with no air conditioning oh, you, know? Yeah. you know and, and we did and we had, so you had uh, evaporative coolers uh which helps some if you got right underneath them mm -hmm. uh, and walk around barefooted of course as you get older you the flesh at the bottom of your feet gets thinner and, and so you can really have trouble but uh, I think about that now and I could no more live down there in, in that temperature. Mm -hmm. or so. my, my grandmother had a, uh, one of the water coolers and evening was always um, wonderful, a wonderful time of day because then that extreme heat's gone, you know, and you can catch the fireflies and hear the bullfrogs and well, you know what happened in, in that, that Bakersfield area? It was a, a social revolution really followed from air conditioners and television. Oh. Because prior to that time, in the evenings in working class neighborhoods, <coughs> excuse me, people would gather, they'd go out and water their lawns, mm -hmm. and the kids would be riding skates and scooters and things up and down the street, and, they, and people would be talking across the lawn to one another. And oftentimes, the, the, the but it was not the only kind the men folk would get together because they'd been working all day. That's when you'd start to hear music, by the way. That's when, oh, really? And somebody might have a folding chair or be sitting on the porch with a guitar, maybe somebody else would walk over with a fiddle. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. I loved it. It was it was my favorite time of the day, as, as you say. And then when I came back from the Army, I went to the Army in 1958, came back in 1960, at the end of 1960, and in that period, my parents had acquired a television set, which they'd never had before. And the neighborhood had acquired television sets. I mean, there were a few before I left, but, but basically the whole neighborhood didn't have television sets, and lots of air conditioners were on windows. They did those, in those days, there were just one room air conditioners, and nobody was going out in the evening anymore. And so, so the, and I, I didn't observe the, the change. I mean, I just came home and there it was, it was gone. They, they actually did one other thing. North of Bakersfield, northeast of Bakersfield, is the, the Kern River oil field, one of the larger oil fields in California. And it's built on rolling hills, kind of leonine hills, kind of tan hills above the Kern River. And when I went in the Army, it had hundreds, probably even thousands, of old cable tool drilling rigs. The, 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 the frames were all still up. And when I came back, they had taken them all down. And it was like I'd come to a different town, because my whole life, They've been there, mm -hmm. and somehow they went in and they changed the technology, and they've got a whole different way of doing it now. Well, anyway, that's not. Okay. okay, so um, we got off a little bit. I had asked you about the the website and um, types of content to put on there for researchers, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the things that we that you mentioned that I made notes of, and we had them in the interview. Of course, would be biographical information. Um, bibliography of her works which is there and Jim has been very helpful with that and then secondary bibliography which I need to need to keep working on I've started trying to do that um, the alternative press movement in the US places she wrote about and wrote from in the link between cultures of Oklahoma and California um, is there anything else uh, as far as the content um, what do you think about her her correspondence 
and and the value of that for researchers. Well, I think it's invaluable because uh, of how she did it. You know that she used the backs of things, backs of envelopes, the backs of bills, and uh, and then she and you would actually sometimes even get letters that she had received, which is I've never never seen that before. But they were you know innocuous mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, I think that'll tell you more about her. And she, she very frequently hand wrote a poem or some part of a poem uh, uh, on the letters. So I think, you know, I think people would really love, they'd really get a, some sense of her as a person mm -hmm. uh, if, they, if they saw that material. Uh, yeah, I definitely would do that. Mm -hmm. Photos? I don't know much about photos. Uh, I've, I know that when I first began seeing the photos of her that were taken when she was young, I didn't recognize her. You know, I did, I, because she had already been in her 50s by the time that I got to know her. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I think, they, I think they would be very important because I, I know now that there, you know, there, are, they, there are photos that, that basically trace her whole life. Mm -hmm. you know, from the time she was an infant, basically, mm -hmm. until she was an old lady. Um, she died with dark hair. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> no, I think photos would be would be interesting. I mean, I think her family. One of the things about this whole uh, question of, of, of the, the migration of the '30s is that there's a lot of stereotypes about the migrants, and she's counter stereotypical. It, Oh, but only be, largely because she's just a unique human being, and people have to. Write. Her her family is not. And they they come out in a in a fancy car from Oklahoma, for example. Mm -hmm. Dad traded for. Sarah. Yeah, and uh, so there's, I mean, and, and I think that needs that kind of thing needs to be stressed a little bit just to break down the stereotype. Mm -hmm. uh, for I, I suppose I have to say, bless his heart, that John Steinbeck unintentionally kind of created a. Mm -hmm. uh, a way, in which, a prism through which this is all viewed, and uh, I don't. Yeah, and yeah, and in Oklahoma, um, everyone is extremely conscious of um, the geography of the state and where the actual dust bowl occurred, mm -hmm. and and people resent. The, the lumping together of this notion, which Simic did, yeah. of you know that that all of Oklahoma was one great big dust yeah, bowl. Or that all or, the dust bowl was in Oklahoma. Right, and that all yeah, of it was extreme. even there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know that, that that it hasn't been written about enough or recognized enough that it was the economic conditions. Yeah. You know, but it, I mean, it kind of came under that label or that term. And I wrote a piece of the happens. nation about oh, four years ago, I suppose that. I, or I mentioned that you know you're you're as apt to be from Southeast Colorado as you were from any part of Oklahoma if you're in the actual Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the Dust Bowl really; it was the Great Depression. Oh, primarily. it was. Yeah, it was a huge you know yeah. swath of you know multiple states where it actually occurred. But of course, a lot of people from Arkansas came came through Oklahoma oh, sure. and migrated. Yeah. And Texas. Lots of well, you yeah. know, California was it, it, the part of California I was from was very interesting because of that. Uh -huh. But uh, a lot of old wounds, I guess. Steinbeck was a wonderful writer. He, he was a truly great writer, oh, okay. and uh, but he, he didn't really know agriculture very well. And, uh, but I think you know I, I don't I don't fault him the way that some folks do simply because I understand what it is to be a writer. And you do the best you can with what you've got. Have you read the uh, scene in the extreme by Rick Wartsman? No. That's a, that's a, a book about the reception of the Grapes of Wrath in California. It just published this uh, in 2008. Rick was actually, when I was a staff writer at the other time, he was my editor. Um, it's, a, it's a good book and it gives you some differing perspectives. Um, it starts by dealing with the banning of the Grapes of Wrath in Kern County, but you know, it, it got banned not for the reasons they say they were banned. It got banned because it exposed the the corporate agriculture's exploitation of migrants. But they claimed, well, it's a dirty book. That's what we're banning it. Well, they, were not, they, they, they had been exposed. They'd been busted. Mm -hmm. And Rick writes about that and about some of these folks. I'll tell you, here's another little story that you probably won't find in any book. But uh, in the 19th, late 1940s, this little town of Oildale, where I was raised, 
um, is, is unincorporated, but it's been there, you know, for a long, long, long over hundred years. Um, and it had grown to the point where it was fifteen or twenty thousand people, and so the so the, the board of supervisors uh, instructed the Department of Education to, to put a high school out there. And so they decided they were going to build a high school, and they were going to, and they were going to call it. Um, What's his name? I'm going to give you a second to think about this. Um, they were going to name it after the publisher of the Bakersfield California, and his name will pop into my mind. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the problem was, that the, it, so here's an area of town that has that is primarily southwesterners uh, and primarily blue collar. Um, and the guy who the, the head of the uh, publisher at the Californian was one of the people who started the the anti-migrant or anti oki movement in California. He was. He was a founder of the California Citizens Association that wanted to deport everybody, and uh, and 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 he got all kinds of corporations involved in it. There were almost no citizens involved in the California Citizens Association. It was high rollers who realized that they were they were being exposed, and suddenly things in their own system was suddenly backfiring on them, and uh, and so my dad and some other men. Uh, went to the school board meeting and said, uh, if you build a school named after that sucker, I don't know what they said, uh, nobody will ever attend it because you're going to be building it, rebuilding it. It's not going to stay up. And uh, the, uh, and, the, and I guess they, they took them seriously. I don't know how long all this took or anything because ultimately they withdrew the name Alfred Harrell High School. Alfred Harrell was a publisher of California. Uh, Ultimately, the school board withdrew that name, but they refused to, as punishment, I guess, they refused to name it Oildale High School. They named it North of the River High School, which is which has now been called North High for years. But and my dad and, and again his generation, those folks he worked with, um, were not happy about. North of the River High School, but they were very unhappy about Alfred Harrell High School. Mm -hmm. But people aren't even aware of the, of the organizations like the California Cavaliers, uh, the Committee of Sixty, California Citizens Association. I mean, these were, were guys who were doing everything they could to hurt the migrants who were already in desperate shape. Mm -hmm. th this is the kind of stuff that got Steinbeck mad, and that's what his he was writing about. Uh, Wurtzman writes about this, uh, uh, he gives you kind of, a, of, a, of an overview uh, of it. I think, I think his book's pretty good. He's, well, he's a good writer, uh, Rick is. Yeah. Should read that. And, uh, and yeah, I think your library ought to have that. Well, yeah, we it, should. It would be yeah. something. If someone reviewed it locally, I bet people would pick it up. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interest in Steinbeck yeah, in Oklahoma yeah. still. We, in 2007, we had our centennial year mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. and. Um, <clears throat> Our community, which was a collaboration with OSU and Stillwater Public Library, the OSU Library, and then the um, the Pioneer Library System down around Norman, we both applied for the Big Read grants from the NEA, which are to do a community-wide reading thing that they just started this a couple of years ago, and we we both were selected, and we both chose the Grapes of Wrath. Mm. It's reading classical literature is what yeah. it's doing, and. Um, and we did it because of the centennial year, but we also yeah. knew that there were still still some strong feelings, sure. you know, in the state. And we thought, what better book to read, you know, yeah, than I this one during idea. our centennial year? And we had great. We did six weeks of programming in Stillwater, and um, a lot of a lot of interest, a lot of participation, a lot of interest in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma. Yeah. A lot yeah. still. People, uh, Timothy Egan just happened to be coming. That spring and, and spoke and and people um, people remember it and uh, have heard stories about it or they remember it or they remember you know their parents or grandparents and it's still very strong. We well, you know, the Cal. I wrote an essay some years ago. Was it uh, called it was the 50th anniversary of the publication of Greeks of Wrath? Yeah, based on a presentation I made at the Steinbeck Center, but it was called a book that stretched my soul. It's in my my book, The Other California. But it's about reading *Grapes of Wrath* when I was in high school, and what I point out in there is that the, the trick among the pe powers of be, the Alfred Heralds of this world, was to get people who hadn't read the book to condemn it. 
thus nobody would read the book. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want people to read it and make their own minds up about it. And they, to a degree, they succeeded. But as, as Rick Wartsman's book shows, they didn't succeed entirely. But I can remember when I was a kid, I'd hear people, well, I, uh, even, even when I'm thinking of kinfolk who, who would simply say, you know, that you're not going to let you go and read that book, are you? And uh, of course, I, had, I read it immediately. Since I read yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, There's stories like that in Oklahoma, too. One, yeah. one woman came to our uh, programs and she said that her mother forbid her to read it when she was growing up. You know, but by and far, everyone was glad that they read it. Finally, you know, yeah. they'd always heard about it and they finally read it and they were so glad they did and they couldn't believe what all the fuss was about, yeah. you know, and... Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've always thought was that the final scene where, where, where Rosa Sharon presents her breast to the starving man mm -hmm. is, is a great scene. I know a lot of people don't like it, but it's sacramental to me. It's where yeah. I read it. And, yeah. uh, uh, and I think it was one of the great scenes in American literature. Mm -hmm. But I can still... Uh, rouse up some of my kid folks, some of my friends over that because they were trained to say, "No, it's just a dirty sex scene." I'm like, well, if you think that's a dirty sex scene, I'd hate to think what your sex life is. <laughs> <laughs> because that's you've got a pretty prurient mind. Uh, not that's a wonderful book, and I I use it in a class I taught in a lifelong learning at University of San Francisco a couple of years ago. Now these are people my age and older by and large, and I'm you know I'm in my seventies now, so. Uh, uh, so a lot of really older people, and a lot of them would s said to me in variations of, of this, you know, when they when they be you begin reading that first chapter, you realize this guy can really write, mm -hmm. and uh, and they would come and they would say, you know, I don't remember being this good. Uh, now they're not making any social judgments because they don't have any, any backgrounds. These are mm -hmm. mostly pretty well-to-do burgers in San Francisco, but but I mean they they really got taken with how good he was. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem, of course, if you don't like what he's doing, because he writes so well that, that, that uh, he's going to carry that message. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, I've always liked to do this battle a lot. Have you read that one? About, it's, about a, it's about a fruit strike, in, uh, in, actually in the modern, uh, Salinas Valley. But it's, it strips pretty bare, and it's, it's not as lush a book. And, when you, he, and, and the action is more immediate. And, uh, not as, it, it doesn't have those reflective chapters, and uh, and it's it's a real indictment of the way workers are exploited by both sides. Did he write that before the Great Suppress? After? Oh no, before. Before. Excuse me, before. Yes, afterwards was the Great Suppress. Okay. We can get it. Yeah. Get my mind straight here. Actually, that whole uh, that whole series he did in the '30s, starting with uh, well, the Pastures of Heaven, really, which he begins in the '20s, but. That uh, to a God unknown, which is I don't think is a particularly good book, but I think is as close to a skeleton key to understanding what follows as you can find, because you realize the guy's not writing one-to-one -one realism; he's writing allegorically to some extent, and it, and it shows. And then you know, down growth, Tortilla Flat, and so on. Uh, now I think he was a wonderful writer. I, I was amazed when in Cal. Uh, 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 the end of the 20th century, the San Francisco Chronicle had a poll about the 100 most important nonfiction, most 100 most important fiction books uh, from the West in the 20th century. And I voted for The Great of Wrath, but the, the winning book was uh, Angle of Repose by Wallace Stegner, which is very much a California book. I, I knew Wallace Stegner and very much admired him as a man, but I would never have, written, have voted for that book hmm. for The Great of Wrath, and didn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> to prove. But I think there's, there's still in California some controversy about it, mostly from people who haven't read it. Mm -hmm. Wilma wrote a, a poem or two and referred to Steinbeck. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, you, you, I, I, over the years I've had a lot of students who write for papers and things whose families were, have been part of the migration. And he's, he, he's a recurrent theme. And some of them take people like Tom Joad, well, Woody Guthrie does this mm. too. Hey, people like Tom Joad as, as though they're real people and begin treating them. And, uh, and I guess in a sense they are real people. Uh, but, uh, well, that's that's going to be a, 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 that, that's one more major link between Oklahoma and California, but culturally, you know, and Wilma's a shining jewel in that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for the interview.
really appreciate it. Um, it's uh, really been a privilege to be able to talk to you today. Well, it's fun to talk. <laughs> I may have to go home and gargle now. I talk too much. <laughs>